Hello, and welcome to MIT Sloan Alumni Online. Every month, MIT Sloan Alumni Online brings you the latest breaking news, cutting-edge research, groundbreaking ideas, and school updates from MIT Sloan faculty and alumni. Today, we are thrilled to have Dr. Stuart Madnick joining us. Dr. Madnick is the John Norris McGuire Professor of Information Technologies here at Sloan, and he is also a Professor of Engineering Systems at the MIT School of Engineering. Dr. Madnick holds a PhD in Computer Science from MIT, has been an MIT faculty member since 1972, and is the Founding Director, Cybersecurity at MIT Sloan, the Interdisciplinary Consortium for Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity, also known as IC Cubed, and he currently heads the Cybersecurity at MIT Sloan Initiative. Dr. Madnick's involvement in cybersecurity research goes back to 1979 when he authored co-authored the book Computer Security. He has also authored or co-authored over 300 books, articles, and reports. In addition to cybersecurity, his other research interests include big data, semantic connectivity, database technology, software project management, and the strategic use of information technology. He has served as a consultant to major corporations and has been the co-founder of five high-tech firms. He currently operates at the 14th Century Langley Castle Hotel in England as well. Professor Madnick, it's great to have you with us here today. Thank you for joining us, and I will now turn it over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, good morning or afternoon or evening to the listeners, depending upon your time zone. It's great to meet so many of you and to share some of the work we're doing here at Sloan. Before I start in my actual presentation, let me read you a couple of the questions we received during the registration process. One of you asked, can you assess the risk to national security posed by cybersecurity threats? And if they are substantial, how can we best motivate our senators and representatives to address the issue? This is actually an important part of what I'm going to be talking about today, both what are the risks and when I talk about managers, I'm also including our elected officials, because they're also managers who have to take responsibility. So I'll be addressing that issue in our talk today. The other question I thought was interesting said that the bad actors always seem to be stepping, staying one step ahead of the good guys. How do we deal with that? And I'm going to talk a lot about what's going on in, in this battle between the good guys and the bad guys, and why, surprisingly, the bad guys are doing so surprisingly well. So let me get into my presentation. I'm not sure it was mentioned in the intro, but I'm going to be asking for a couple of votes or a polling as we go. Uh, I'm not sure if anything needs to be explained, Tyler, for that process. But let me get on to the first uh, question, if I will. My question to you is, do you know if your organization has experienced a cyber attack? And I think on your screen you can see a poll question. You can either click the A or B, A for yes or B for no. And uh, I think Tyler will tell us the vote. So please do that now. Make sure you hit the Submit button at the uh, bottom right of your screen. So while, you, while you're doing that polling, and, and in a minute uh, Tyler will tell me what you uh, did, let me tell you the reason why I phrased the question quite the way I just did. I have a comment I often tell people that nowadays there's only two kinds of organizations. Those that know they've been hacked and those that don't yet know they've been hacked. And the reason why I say that, according to various studies, in the United States, the average attack has been underway for over 200 days before it's detected. And another recent study of the Asia Pacific region, that number raised over 400 days before it was discovered. So often a hack may be going on and you just don't aware of it. So how many of you are aware of an attack on your organization? Tyler, do we have numbers yet? Okay, that, that's interesting. So uh, according to the study so far, about 50 to a little bit half of you, basically half of you have and half of you haven't. Those who haven't, just stay tuned. Uh, the, your turn will come, or conversely, the discovery will come by before too long. So let me continue on what I'm going to try to talk about today. So m many of you have had some experience, and hopefully what I talk about today will resonate. Oh, by the way, let me see, uh, Tyler, how do I get the camera back again? Uh, well, it was not that important. I'm assuming I'm assuming I'm still visible. I can't see what I'm looking like, though. Uh, 
If you need to see your webcam, remember just to open the participants panel one more time. Okay. Thank you again for the reminder. Okay, there we go. I can see it. Thank you very much, Simon. It's great help. So this is going to be my agenda. I'm not going to read off all the items. I'll just go through them one by one as we progress today. Uh, to, for many of you, the assumption may be that cybersecurity yeah, is an issue, but it's really just a matter of credit card numbers being stolen. And at least in the United States, in most cases, you're only responsible for about $50 of what may be taken. And actually, in reality, most credit card companies don't even bother charging you that. So it doesn't seem like such a big deal. Well, let's talk about it. One of the issues, let me get back here again. Sorry. One of the issues you may want to think about is, well, should a manager or, or a top executive really care about cybersecurity? It wasn't that many years ago, I say, that cybersecurity was really a task assigned to the junior assistant programmer trainee who would go desktop to desktop with the latest floppy disk of Microsoft patches to install. Nowadays, it's a key issue at the top executive and even at the board level. A couple examples some of you may be familiar with fairly recently in the case of the Equifax break-in, the CIO, Chief Information Officer, and Chief Security Officer out. There was a big call that the CEO be fired. Those, this was from uh, September 16th. It took 10 days for the CEO actually to retire. So it, it can have a big impact at top executives but also could have an impact throughout the organization. I'm not sure how many of you remember the WannaCry attack that happened on uh, May 12th. One of my students rushed into my office that morning. It turns out he's a Spanish student who had previously worked at Telefonica, and he had received a message from one of his colleagues who had worked with him. Uh, my, my Spanish is terrible, of course, but he translated this to a message that's urgent, quickly turn off your laptop. But in fact, that didn't get out fast enough. And in that particular case, 80% of all the computers at Telefonica were shut down. And basically, they just sent all the employees home. And in fact, over 300,000 computers in over 100 countries were attacked within hours. So this can have a major impact on organization. So as I say, it's not just a matter of credit card numbers. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of ransomware. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. But as the Wall Street Journal points out, it's really the issue where a hacker comes in, doesn't necessarily steal anything. He just locks up your computer and locks up your data so you can't access your computer or you can't get the data that you have on your computer. But let's go beyond ransomware. I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with SWIFT. SWIFT is a messaging system that's responsible for moving money around the world. In fact, on a typical day, approximately, I think the number is about $7 trillion are moved using SWIFT. And as many of you may have known, there was a break-in, kind of indirectly at least, involving the SWIFT to the Bank of Bangladesh. They managed to make off in about $80 million. But in fact, they were actually trying to get close to $1 billion. And only due to a few minor mishaps on the hacker's part, they might have gotten off with a billion dollars. So it could be a significant amount of money involved, a lot more than the number that your credit card is worth. And of course, it's not just about money. Uh, there's been a lot of information in the press in the US and also around the world about hackers interfering with or dealing with uh, election systems, both at the state level and the federal level. But the thing I really want to stress, you now these are all issues regarding money. It can be much more than just money. It can be your property or even your life. Here's a couple of examples of that. So for example, many of you may have known that the ransomware attacks basically lock up your computers so you cannot use them. There have been major ransomware attacks on hospitals around the world. This is one, an article regarding the attack on UK hospitals. Imagine you're in the intensive care unit of a hospital and the nurse no longer has access to know what medications you're supposed to have today to keep you alive. That, that could have major consequences on your life. Moving on to property, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the attack on the German steel mill or the attack on the Turkish pipeline or the attacks on various uh, power grids around the world, uh, most notably the, the several attacks on the Ukrainian power grid that shut down much of the country. Let's pause for a second. Many of you may say, well, this is kind of interesting. 
but hey, I'm not in the hospital or gas or steel or electricity business. Why should I care? Well, just think about it for a second. What if your company lost all electric power? But, but not for three hours, but maybe for three days. Or how about for three weeks? Do you think that might have some impact upon your business? Now, that's kind of a, a maybe a scary notion, and I encourage many of you to go and look at this book by Ted Koppel called Lights Out. He writes uh, here that he uh, explains a devastating cyber attack on America's power grid is not only possible but likely. And the United States is shockingly unprepared. This goes back earlier to the comments I mentioned regarding uh, senators and congressmen. One of the things you might do sometime is ask your local governor or mayor you know, what their fallback plan is if they lose electric power in your city or your state for three weeks or more. Let me raise one other issue. This gets into the issue often people ask about regarding the, the public-private relationship. Let's imagine for a moment here now that there are enemy aircraft flying over your company, over your factories and so on, dropping bombs on them. You would imagine the U.S. or your local country's Air Force would go and try to shoot those bombers down. But if the same kind of damage is being done by a cyber attack, to a large extent, you're on your own. So those are the kind of challenges, I think, that make it a much bigger issue than just a matter of credit card numbers being stolen. Now, for some good news, as many of you know, there's been a lot of progress being made by all the good guys trying to prevent all these things from happening. And things, in fact, are getting better. In fact, I kind of roughly use this diagram here. The good news, the good guys are getting better in terms of their effectiveness to ward off cyber attacks. The thing that doesn't necessarily get as much attention is, in fact, the bad eyes, bad guys are getting better even faster. In fact, this headline in the Washington Post says it very well. Hackers are getting better at offense. Companies aren't getting that much better at defense. So let's talk a little bit about why that might happen. Well, once upon a time, if you wanted to be a hacker, typically you needed to have a, you know extensive background in computer science, computer technology, which really limited the number of people who could do it and also could limit the amount of damage they could do. But that's all changing. You don't need to be a super techie hacker. You can pretty much buy whatever you need to do a cyber attack. In particular, for example, as you may have heard, the NSA was suffered a cyber attack, and many of the cyber weapons that they had been developing, often possibly at millions or even billions of dollars of cost, were stolen and are now available for sale for around $14.95. And many of those type of weapons were actually used in the WannaCry attack, as highlighted here. The NSA hacking tools revealed and available for sale. Now, all of it sounds kind of onerous and obviously you're not worried about it, but hey, isn't that just a technology problem best left to the, left to the IT folks uh, to take care of? My view there is several fold. First, yes, it's true that there's need for and a lot of progress being made in improving the hardware and software to make it more resistant to cyber attacks. But one thing you need to note, according to many studies, the majority of events, often estimates range from 70 to 80 percent, are aided or abetted by insiders, usually unintentionally. That's why and why it's so critical for the MIT Sloan to be involved, is because it's critically important to address the managerial, organizational, and strategic aspects of cybersecurity. We're going to talk much more about this as we go through the session today. Now, I have an interesting question here. I don't know how many of you remember this issue. Uh, I don't know, maybe it goes back three or four years ago. I, I don't have a chance to have you do, raise your hands, but I do it in the classroom. And usually I'll find a third to half the class will raise their hand. Of having gotten an email, something of this form. Hello, I am a Nigerian prince. I just inherited $100 million. I'm so happy with my, with my good luck, I want to share it with the world. Now, I was surfing around on the Internet, and I came across your name. You seem like a really good person. I would like to give you $1 million. All you have to do is pay the gift tax on it, etc., etc. 
Okay. Now, hopefully, not too many of you have got those. And for those who got them, hopefully you didn't necessarily click on them. But this is often an example of what's called phishing. Now, there's a great title that Gardner came out with a report. I wish I had thought about that in advance. Uh, the title was Prevention is Futile. Uh, those of you who have dealt with uh, 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 phishing in the past or, or Star Trek in the past are familiar with the notion of the Borg where the resistance is futile. So the question is, you know, phishing. Phishing is those kinds of emails I just talked to you about. Uh, and those are, I call mass phishing, uh, the, the Nigerian prince kind. And those have an open rate of around, you know, 1 to 3 percent. They can be better crafted phishing ones that you may have seen, a notice from the help desk saying we're updating our system, you need to do certain procedures in order to validate it. So those have a slightly higher hit rate. But now I have my second poll question. How many of you have heard of or know what the term or what the notion of spear phishing is? I'll give you a, a, a minute or so to be submitting your answers while, while I do this. But the key idea I'm trying to get to is that there's many different approaches that basically involve what I've often referred to as using social engineering to deal with it. Not breaking cryptographic codes, but basically tricking you into doing things you shouldn't do. I don't know how many of you have been at a building or, or a uh, housing complex where there's a note in the door that says, do not let strangers in. But you open the door and someone's right behind you. How often do you slam your door on that person right behind you? Uh, Tyler, do we have any uh, count on the spear phishing question? Do we have an answer yet in the, top, in the poll? Okay. So it looks like, actually, we're pretty good. It looks like about 40% of you know of something about spear phishing, and likewise about 30% uh, uh, you know, have, have heard about it, and about 30% of you have no idea what it is at all. So let me tell you what spear phishing is, and, and for those who know, let me kind of elaborate a little bit more about it. Spear phishing is very targeted uh, email. Uh, the classic case is a email uh, sent uh, from, apparently sent from the CEO to the CFO. This is something like we have a major new project underway. It's very, very important, but also, of course, very, very confidential. But we have a law firm we retain to help us uh, with this. It's very important that you send them $50,000 today. And by the way, I wish I would have called you, uh, but of course, I'm at a conference today. I really don't have access to a phone. What would you do if you're the CFO? Now, if you're not too careful, you might just send the money right away. But let's say you've heard of spear phishing and you're a bit cautious. So you call the CEO's office and the secretary answers the phone and guess what? The CEO indeed is at a conference today and in fact has said he's not reachable by phone. What do you do? You've got a clear message from the CEO that this is critically important and this deal may fall through if you don't send the $50,000. Do you risk your job either way? by either sending it or not sending it. Now, I'm picking on the poor CFO and CIO. It turns out there was a recent article on the CNN that pointed out this has been going on at government circles. The, the White House has been hacked several times in this way, uh, some leading to some funny stories and which leading to people getting fired. Uh, similar attacks were done to the CEO of Goldman Sachs, uh, the Citibank, Barclays Bank. So in other words, this has been, and the reason why people do this, get back on the right screen again, is because it works. According to various studies, 70% of really well-planned, well-targeted spear phishing actually do spear the fish, if you will. So that's why it's very important to understand that phenomenon. Now, I've been spending most of my time now trying to kind of raise the issue of why we think this is quite important. And in many ways, we're in a fantastic time in our age uh, we have a lot of colleagues here working both at MIT Sloan and elsewhere producing what's often called the digital economy, the digital world. That's all great news, but also it's exposing us to risks unknown in the past. So we've got that double-edged double, double -edged sword there. One of the questions people often ask me after having heard these concerns is what are some of the best practices? Now, I have a somewhat strong view to say, and that is that my personal view is there are no best practices. All there are are poor practices 
and less poor practices. Because this phenomenon is so new and in most organizations is not addressed sufficiently well. And this is not just my view. I won't repeat everything here, but at a recent meeting, they, they was recommended that they no longer use the term best practice, but just refer to it as current practices or practice sharing. And I often summarize it by saying, if the NSA, the CAA, the Pentagon, the Israeli Defense Forces can be broken into, why do you think you're so much better? But let me be a little bit positive by saying, what are things you can do? There's something that used to be referred to as the White House's cybersecurity framework. In fact, this had a lot to do with how we decided to create this uh, effort here within the Sloan School. Uh, it now was the responsibility of managing it and, pr and promoting it has been transferred to the National Institute of Science and Technology. So it's often referred to now as the NIST cybersecurity framework. And I'm going to just give you a few quick highlights of it. But it's got five key areas. Unfortunately, most people pay almost focus almost exclusively on the second one, the protect, which I'll get to in a minute. But the first one identify, and that is developing the organizational understanding that there is a cybersecurity risk. This has a lot to do with how you adapt the culture of your organization, which I'll say more about in a few minutes. As I said, a lot of effort is going in to appropriate safeguards. And of course, that's a great thing to do to make your system as resilient as possible. Even as an interesting side effect, you probably have all heard the joke about two hunters in the woods, and all of a sudden a bear comes out of the woods. And one hunter starts running. And the second hunter says, hey, you can't outrun the bear. And he says, all i got to do is outrun you. The key thing here, obviously, if you're better protected than your next-door neighbor, maybe the hackers will attack your next-door neighbor instead of you. But the point being is, is, according to every expert you look at, there's no amount of safeguards that can guarantee you 100% safety. So then we move on to the third issue, detection. As I already mentioned before, most organizations do a surprisingly poor job of this. Uh, often these attacks are going on for, for weeks. In some cases, we've seen attacks are going on for more than a year and a half before they were discovered. So being able to detect that a hack is going on. And of course, once you've discovered a hack is going on, what do you do in order to handle it or how to take action? For example, it, think about this for a moment. In your organization, if you're hit with a serious ransomware attack, has your organization decide the policy? Will they pay? Will they not pay? What action would they take in that? Have they planned that in advance rather than trying to make it up on the fly? And then finally, the issue of recover. So what do you do if, you, if there's no power for your company for three weeks? Do you have a plan for dealing with that? Or how do you go about getting things back on to the correct heel? So this NIST cybersecurity framework, if it's being used in your organization, that's great, and it can be very, very helpful for many organizations. If it's not being used, it's something you really should look seriously at. But unfortunately, it's not the total answer. For those of you who have done very little or don't have something like this going on, it gives you some direction and gives you some ideas of how to improve your situation. But unfortunately, for many, it merely becomes a lower upper bound that doing just the things in this framework recommends is helpful, but it's not enough. You've got to do a lot more. And in fact, according to a recent uh, uh, conference that was held, many of the people who are using the frameworks said that it, it raised, the results raised from being pleased to fail. And in general, it doesn't replace the really hard work that must be going on. It's, uh, if you have low expectation, it's a big success. But in fact, it's not the total answer. So my point is, it's a good thing to move forward on. For those who are doing it, make sure you do it well. For those who aren't doing it, it's definitely worth trying to, to move things forward. Now, we're about almost halfway, or a little over halfway through my talk. And so far, I've been giving you maybe a lot of what might be viewed as being bad news, or at least concerning news. So what is it you can do that can make a difference? And more particularly, what is MIT Sloan doing to help the situation? Now, Kathy, at the beginning, quickly rattle off the name of our organization that we've created. That initial name was called Interdisciplinary Consortium for Improving Critical Infrastructure Cybersecurity. Now, that's a real mouthful. But the initials are IC, IC, OIC, or we call it IC cubed, because the, the motivation behind that 
was that although security of conventional information systems, whether it be Target or Sony or Uber most recently, is not totally effective, the real issue is what we call the cyber physical infrastructure and the emergence of Internet of Things or IoT devices, computer controlled utilities, home sensors, oil and gas sites, uh, autonomous vehicles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, that does not has not had anywhere near as much attention to it, and a lot more is needed to be done. And as I, as we already said, although a lot of research has gone on to improve the hardware and software, a majority of events are aided or abetted by insiders. So that's why we need to address the managerial, organizational, and strategic aspects of cybersecurity. So I'm not going to be able, and this slide is probably a little bit too dense for most of you to see. Uh, that we'll, uh, at the end, I'll give you a link to go back and look at it. But we have approximately 21 projects currently underway here at MIT Sloan looking at those three aspects, the strategic aspects, what is it the Board of Governors and the CEO should be doing, at the management level, what is it the various aspects of management should be doing, and at the organization level, whether you're whether you realize or not, everybody in the organization has a role to play. So without going through all of that, that would take us probably well into 20 hours of a webinar. I'm going to just take a few minutes on three of the projects just to give you the flavor of the kinds of things we're doing. And those who have an interest in any one of these three or any of the other uh, 21 on that slide be glad to link you up either in working papers we have or talk to you about work we're doing or maybe even explore ways we could collaborate on them. So these are the three projects I'm going to talk about. Now, as I said before, there are many other exciting ones ranging from board of directors to cyber insurance, etc. But I'm going to talk about just these three projects. Now for those of you, we call this the MIT House of Security. For those of you who have any dealings in the area of cyber security, People often talk about the CIA. Now, I don't mean the Central Intelligence Agency, but the issues of confidentiality, integrity, and availability is the three things you're trying to prevent or, or deal with or maintain in your organization. I'll view that's correct, but that's like the roof of the house. They don't exist in a vacuum, and there are things you've got to do to make those things work. Things like the resources you're applying, your business strategy, your security strategy, your security culture. So we're looking at how to analyze those aspects of an organization. And once again, this is just an example we do. We try to assess what is the current state of security in your organization, what is the desired state or, or did you think you need in your organization. And we often do is we measure the delta, the gap. How far are you from where you are to where you should be in different organizations? And you see this spider chart here uh, illustrating it. And as you see here, there are some areas where the gaps are relatively small. There are some areas where the gaps are fairly large. And we do this in several ways. We do this looking at companies in different industries, saying which industries are better prepared, have bigger issues. We do it between companies, you know, how are different companies in the same industry doing. But more importantly, we do it within companies. So for example, are the views of top management consistent with the views of middle management and the professionals? Are the views of people in the IT space or the cybersecurity space and others in the organization aligned? So we're trying to understand kind of the perspective of the culture within an organization and the perception within the organization across the organization. As I say, we have a lot more I don't have time to talk about today, but hopefully you find that somewhat interesting. The second one I want to talk about is work we often refer to here as cyber safety. The idea here is that many people, including researchers here at MIT, have for many years looked at ways to reduce or prevent accidents in industrial settings. One of the things we're trying to do is see how can we take lessons learned and research done to prevent accidents and use it to help prevent cybersecurity failures. Accidents in cybersecurity are not exactly the same, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of important lessons we can learn. There's a fascinating story I don't have time for right now today to talk about how this kind of analysis was used at NASA to try to understand the organizational reasons behind the challenge of space shuttle explosion. But we've, we've ta taken this concept and applied it to cybersecurity, analyzing things like the Stuxnet event and the TGX event, and have managed to discover and uncover 
all kinds of vulnerabilities not previously discovered. So let me just say a little bit about the approach we take in this uh, cyber safety. It's a very simple concept. What it says that every process in your organization, whether it's an electronic process, a mechanical process, or a human process, has some control mechanism. This control mechanism is monitoring the process and is providing feedback or influencing the process. But that control process itself is a process and so there is another control process that's controlling that control process. And you apply this concept hierarchically. Now that's kind of abstract. I'm going to take just a few minutes to illustrate how this plays out. As one example, we use the TJX credit card. TJX is the parent company of TJ Maxx, Marshalls, uh, Home Goods, and so on. At the time of the attack, it was a big attack, 45 million credit cards. Nowadays, that's a round-off error. It probably doesn't even make coverage in the newspaper. But at the time, it was a big attack and got a lot of attention. When we use our cyber safety analysis, we end up in a diagram like this. Once again, probably too dense for you to see, but people often focus on a little red circle at the bottom, over the circle. That's where the event took place. Such, but just like on the Challenger Space Shuttle, all the attention was focused on the O-rings that fractured and caused the explosion, not on all the events that led up to the O-rings event. Let me jump real quickly way up here to the top left of the slide. State legislature. What in the world does the state legislature have to do with a credit card break-in in TJX that initially originated at a Marshall store at a shopping mall in Florida. Well, first thing for those of you who've been at MIT Sloan may know, TJX's headquarters is just about 20 miles from here in Framingham, Massachusetts. The thing you may not know, there's something called PCI DSS, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, which is a recommendation that credit card, provide, uh, credit card processing, like retail organizations, should follow. It turns out in the state of Nevada, that is not just a recommendation, that is a law. If you are a retail organization in Nevada, you are obligated to be PCI DSS compliant. It turns out Massachusetts state legislature, for lots of reasons, had not made that a requirement. And it turns out that TGX was not PCI DSS compliant. So the action or inaction of the state legislature, not the only factor, but it played a contributing factor to what happened. I'm going to skip over this diagram here, which goes through the step-by-step -step process by which we do our cyber safety analysis, and just jump to a few interesting insights that came out of it. Most organizations actually incur much increased cybersecurity risk when they change their state of operation. In the case of TJX, it was one of the first retail organizations to go heavily into Wi-Fi, which made it much easier to move around uh, point-of-sale stations within uh, the stores without having to rewire it and so on. So it was a great technological advance, just like there are many technological advances being done most likely in your companies. But as a result, prior experiences with cyber risks were not well known, and prevention of cyber risks were not well known. So that's the first concern. When you change from one state to a new state, you're often opening up new possibilities. The second issue was often referred to as recall bias. It's a very simple concept. If you've not been broken into before, the natural assumption is you won't be breaking in, broken into in the future. It, it sounds very simplistic, but it's amazing. We've been proven time and time again, humans do fall into this recall bias. The third thing is called, we call the confirmation trap. This is an actual email sent from the CIO of TGX to his staff. Roughly speaking, what it says is, we know that we're not PCI DSS compliant. But on the other hand, we know that's going to be a big job. It's going to be very costly. We're entering now the Christmas season, which is very busy for us. Don't you all agree with me that it's fine if we postpone it till next year? This may shock you, but most of his staff did not object to that ocean. So in some cases, you kind of kid yourself into thinking that you're more than, more than enough secure. Now, we picked the, T, the TGX case because that's a case that got a lot of attention at the time. It involved serious investigations by the Federal Trade Commission in the United States and the CTC Commission in Canada. 
And what you see here in the middle of the slide are various recommendations they made. When we do our cyber safety analysis, we came up with a series of recommendations that were not uncovered or didn't evolve out of the ad hoc procedures used by the FTC. So we believe a systematic study. Now, in this case here, we're looking at the aftermath of an attack. We're using the same kind of analysis in advance to see what kinds of exposures you have in your organization, what kind of managerial decisions or indecisions are you making that put you more at risk. So the cyber safety analysis approach really provides tremendous insights. I have one last uh, example to put up, and this is also going to be our third and final poll question for today, and that is how many of you have heard of a bug bounty program or know what a bug bounty program is? So we'll take a minute or so to let you answer this question. But while you're answering the question, let me just give you kind of an uh, 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 assumption about, well, let me back up a little, let you answer the question first before you bias you. The question is, and this relates to another issue, has to do with workforce. I don't know what the situation is in your particular company. There was a study done that said that by the year 2020, which is not that many years away, is estimated to be over a 2 million person shortfall of cybersecurity workers both in government agencies and in companies. So the question, we're looking very much at various ways, novel ways both to train people faster as well as novel ways to deal with this possible shortage of cybersecurity workers. So Tyler, uh, do we have the results of the poll yet? I, I don't see the results yet. Let me just continue. Oh, yeah, okay. So it looks like uh, about 35% of you have heard of it and about 65% have not. So let me explain whether bug bounty program is. As I explained it, this may ring a bell to you. The idea is a company will offer a reward, much like the old days of, of reward posters for criminals. You post them at the post office. If you happen to find this criminal, report him to the police, you will get a reward. The same idea here. You as a freelancer, you on your own, if you find a vulnerability in one of, the, one of our systems and report it to us, we will give you a reward. And there are hundreds of companies now running them, there's a company called HackerOne that runs bug bounty programs, actually I think for well over 100 companies now. So let me give you an example of the issue of this regard. The Department of Defense had previously, over three years, had hired an outside vendor to analyze its systems to try to find cybersecurity flaws in its systems. And it found about 10 vulnerabilities and it cost the DOD about $10 million. But then the Pentagon offered a Hack the Pentagon program. We're invited 1,400. These are often referred to as ethical hackers, often known as white hats. These are people who had participated in such uh, bug bounty programs for other companies. And 250 of them found at least one vulnerability. And of those, 138 were found to be unique, legitimate, and actionable vulnerabilities. The total, and this was done in three months, and the total cost was $150,000. Now, for those of you who are mathematically astute, if you have a choice of spending three years and $5 million to find 10 vulnerabilities, and the other option is spending $150,000 in three months to find 138, I'll let you decide what sounds more attractive. I'm not trying to say that either one of them necessarily is the right answer for your company, but it definitely indicates that there are creative ways, new ways to approach this problem that companies haven't looked at before. Now, I want to end in the next three minutes to give us about 15 minutes for Q&A. So let me summarize with a few conclusions. As I often, you know, the good news, as I said before, there's increasing amount of automation, computerization, digitization, call it what you want to. Many of you may or may not be familiar with this term, Internet of Things or IoT, but the idea being is computers are being put into almost every device you can imagine. I jokingly said to someone once that uh, there will be computers in almost everything except bricks, and he showed me an article about smart bricks, so I may be wrong there. The funny story, I, maybe I'll call it a funny story, was that there was an LG refrigerator, computerized, Wi-Fi connected refrigerator, so when you're shopping at the supermarket, you basically could look inside your refrigerator at home and see whether you're running low on milk or eggs. Sounds like a great idea. The thing that one person didn't realize is that the refrigerator had been hacked, and while pumping out ice cubes, was sending out pornographic spam. 
So there's a whole bunch of things that we've never seen before that are, that are coming to our rep. And so I often say this creates a, a, a tremendous increase in attack surfaces, leading us to the concern that the worst is yet to come. But as I said before, you and your organization can be better prepared than others. But the important thing for you and your colleagues to know is management, not just the IT folks, not just the computer folks, management needs to take an important lead and an important role. I think I'm almost just about on time. I will note those of you who have a lot more questions, as I said, I apologize for having to compress an awful lot into about 40 minutes. We do encourage you to either go to our website, ic3.mit.edu, or contact either me or Michael Siegel or Kerry Pearlson, my, my other directors. I will now open this up for questions. I think maybe Kathy has a few she wants to pose from you. Thank you, Professor Madnick. As a reminder to our participants, please type in your questions in the Q&A box on the right side of the screen. Take a moment to make sure that you've selected all panelists before submitting your questions. While you're doing that, I'd like to take a moment to tell you about an upcoming program. On Wednesday, January 24th, Professor Doug Reedy will join us for our next MIT Sloan Alumni Online program. Professor Reedy will be speaking about the top team's job in building game-changing organizations. You can register on the MIT Sloan Alumni Online website or stay tuned for future com communications from our team with details. So now let's move on to your questions. We'd like to start today's Q&A with some spotlight questions that were submitted during the registration process. Our first question comes from Jessica Serrano, MBA class of 2001. Jessica's in Mexico City and asks this. The financial sector is highly exposed to cyber risk. What do you see as the most important implications for systemic risk within a country and globally? Well, that's an excellent question. I, I can't remember the, the actual date, but within the last week or two, I believe there was a report or testimony by the head of the SEC who commented that cybersecurity is the greatest risk to the worldwide financial services system. Now, I, I don't remember exactly the details of exactly why that position was taken, but let me raise a couple thoughts about the financial services industry. Number one, if you think about it, it is tremendously based upon the issue of trust. Now, when you look at your website or whether you deposit money into the bank, you like to feel the money is really there. If anything happens that seriously diminishes your faith and trust in the financial system, that has huge rippling effects. To some extent, a large portion of what ended up being the magnifying effect in 20, uh, 2007 and 2008 financial crash had a lot to do with people basically didn't know who to trust and basically withheld their resources. So the biggest, you know, there are all kinds of threats to the financial services issue. Uh, but one of the ones that could be most traumatic is that it's something that really knocks your confidence. Uh, I was interviewed on a panel that was hosted by CNBC uh, about six or nine months ago, and the moderator started it off by saying he wakes up in the morning and he has a nightmare. And the nightmare is he goes to his uh, online bank account and sees the balance being zero. And his question to the panelists was, could this happen? And the panelists kind of caught off guard as the first question, so I jumped to the occasion and said, oh, it's not a matter of if it will happen, it's only a matter of when it will happen and what the consequences will be because it's relatively easy to interfere, whether the money is actually stolen or just you don't know how much money you have. That's a serious issue. Now, as I say for the financial services sector, the old joke, you know, why do bank robbers rob banks? The answer, that's where the money is. So the financial service sector is the one that's under the most attacks constantly. Let me move on to the other questions, because I could spend hours talking about the financial services sector and its challenges, both in our country but also globally. Okay, thank you. Our next spotlight question is from Roger McPeak, FM 1987 from Winchester, Massachusetts. And Roger's question is, what physical systems are best at protecting data? Okay, so uh, he actually, in, in the quote that appears on the screen here, he gives some examples. He talks about air gap networks and data separation. 
And uh, I, I want to welcome Roger. He, I guess he's kind of a neighbor of ours here in Massachusetts. Uh, once again, I don't know the different industries that, that, the, that the participants listening in today are in, but particularly you'll find in manufacturing and industrial systems, they'll often say, well, our risk is somewhat minimized because our factories are air-gapped. What air-gapped means they're not connected to the, to the public Internet, so viruses and malware can't get on uh, to, our, to our systems. I have several com two reactions to that. The first reaction, unfortunately, or fortunately, is that is definitely not the direction things are going in. More and more companies are tr wanting to, pr to connect the equipment to the Internet in order to better monitor, maintain, and update the equipment. So you install a piece of equipment from Siemens or a Honeywell or Philips. Uh, the, you know, that could be once to, quote, call home, if you will, and tell it how it's doing. So the, 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 in, the amount of things that are being interconnected to it that are growing in, ex exponentially. But let's take the extreme case. Let's say you say, okay, I'm willing to forego whatever benefits, and there are lots of benefits to being better connected, and I will, in fact, ear gap my system. By the way, it's not always clear you even know they're being ear gap. Uh, I mentioned that the... Uh, Iranian Stuxnet attack to the Iranian uh, nuclear enrichment facility. That facility, in fact, was air gap. One of my students pointed out to me that a virus made it to the International Space Station. Talk about the size of an air gap. So the trouble is, even when you think you're air gapped, it's not really sufficient protection. Uh, this is probably less prominent today, but a popular thing that they would do around a factory, and the hackers would do, is drop off USB drives, USB memory sticks, in the parking lot, hoping that some worker will say, this is interesting, wonder what it is, take it into the factory, plug it into his computer, and in fact, unleash a virus. Now, that may sound like you know, a dumb thing to do. A more subtle issue is the repairman comes to you, pick your favorite vendor, whether it be Siemens or Philips, and I'm sorry, I taught you, I'm sure I'm, I'm neglecting somebody comes to check out your equipment. He brings his laptop because he's had all the diagnostics on it. It's not clear that his, that his laptop wasn't being used last night by his kids to download games that involve the virus that when on his laptop, he plugs it in, et cetera, et cetera. So my only comment is is that, yes, air gapping is an interesting strategy. It is not where the, where the industry is going. And even when you are air gapped, it's not sufficient. You have to really address the whole managerial processes involved in your organization. One of the classics, and I've seen this at least two different systems, one a, a, a energy plant, the other case was a merchant marine ship where the operator on the light night shift brought a USB drive in so he could watch movies because it's pretty boring at 2 o'clock in the morning just watching gauges that don't do anything. So there's just so many human factors that people don't think about. I'm sorry for groaning on, but this ear gap issue is a, in some sense, a red herring. And unfortunately, I, 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 too many executives have talked themselves into a false sense of security. But A, by thinking the ear gap, and in many cases, they weren't, they just didn't realize it. Or B, were ear gapped and assumed that that solved all their problems. Kathy, any others? Hey. Thank you. Uh, so now let's move on to some live questions from our viewers. Uh, Professor Madnick, can you please provide some guidance on cybersecurity in the context of health data? That's a fascinating question regarding health systems in general. I, I, in one of the slides I put up earlier, I mentioned the issue of a uh, uh, cyber attack, a ransomware attack on the United Kingdom's national health system. This is something that many of you may not be familiar with, at least according to a 2016 report. I haven't seen the 2017 report yet. But in 2016, 88% of all cyber attacks in the United States were to hospitals. For two reasons. Health care, and once again, I, I'm not, I can't generalize too broadly, if you will. But in general, healthcare systems have not paid as much attention, are often not as sophisticated in their cybersecurity, on the one hand. So the defenses are often weaker. And on the other hand, in terms of ransomware attack, there are, in fact, lives at risk. So the probability of the hospital paying the ransom is higher. So there's lots of issues, and we're working very closely with the healthcare industry to really try to improve that situation dramatically. But it is a big challenge. And, of course, in many cases, it does affect our lives. So it's important to us. 
Indeed. Uh, our next question comes from Orhan Karslagil. Uh, apologize for that. Um, who do you think will use AI in cybersecurity first, hackers or defenders? Well, that's a fascinating question. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be, uh, let me uh, I'll take that question and stretch it out a little bit. Earlier, I, I mentioned the issue of the good guys and the bad guys. So one thing I didn't say, from our study so far, the bad guys are much better at innovating and sharing than the good guys are. You know, if your company is attacked, and if, it, if it's a credit card type theft, you are required by law to notify credit card people. But if you're a German steel mill and you're melted down, there's no law that says you have to go and publicize. In fact, that German steel mill still denies it even happened, even though it was reported by Bloomberg. So the good guys, in many ways, have lots of impediments to sharing knowledge. The bad guys are exactly the opposite. Reputation is golden. If you're the one who blew up that steel mill, you spout it all over the place, telling people how you did it. So the amount of information sharing that goes on on the dark web is fascinating. And that's one of the areas of research we're looking at is trying to understand better the whole cyber crime ecosystem. It is an elaborate global ecosystem, amazingly effective and amazingly dangerous out there. Thank you. Uh, from David Medro, do you have any research on specific cybersecurity metrics that are effective in assessing an organization's approach to cybersecurity? Well, that, that is a great question. When I talk to CEOs of almost every company about our work on cybersecurity, that's probably one of the top questions that come up. You know, what are the appropriate method, met, metrics? The problem we have, uh, it's a challenging issue, and we are researching it, but the reason why it's challenging, every company and every consulting firm has the answer. The answer roughly in statistic firm is you merely take the magnitude of the impact times the probability of the impact, and that tells you what your risk is, and that tells you your metrics. The only problem is nobody knows how to measure X and Y. Other than that, we know the formula. So the research is all done. It's just the implementations where the challenge lies. And so what we're trying to do is find better ways to address this issue of how to measure cybersecurity organization, to how to know how much you've improved and what are the, met what are the methods and things you can do to improve your most. So that is a great question. It is one of the biggest challenges every organization has and is one of the major topics we have in our project. We have ideas underway. We have, do not have the magic silver bullet yet. So stay tuned and watch for our reports coming out on our notion about metrics. Uh, I think we have maybe just a few minutes left for any more questions, Kathy? Yes, we do have another one uh, from Robert Vega. His question is, who do you see using AI more aggressively? I'm sorry. Oh, I said, oh that's, I'm fine. Sorry. that's fine. That's, that's fine. Okay. Okay. I, didn't really, I, didn't really answer, I didn't really answer the first part of that question, the issue of AI. And the answer is it, both of them are using it. Uh, as many of you may know, MIT has established a collaboration with IBM. IBM is doing a lot of work at AI uh, with their you know, IBM Watson and so on uh, to try to find ways to, to make uh, computers better and smarter. On the other hand, uh, there is almost two things happening. Number one, almost all the breakthroughs on the good guy side end up being stolen by the bad guys. So they end up learning almost as fast as the good guys do. And in addition, the bad guys are also using AI. So the answer is a horse race going on. I can't tell you who's going to win this time, but unfortunately the bad guys have been winning pretty much each time so far. One thing I've got to say one more last thing. I didn't quite explain why this metrics issue was, was so challenging. Because if you, think about, if you think about things like hurricanes, you know, we have hundreds of years of data. Admittedly, every year is different, but we have hundreds of years of data. We have statistical data to base it upon. Every year like the attack on the SWIFT or the ransomware attacks, every year something new happens we've never seen before. There is no statistical data on which to base things in, in terms of the probability of it happening. And secondly, we have not developed a very effective way. One of the things you should do in your own organization, either yourself or your top executives, when you chat with them, how well do you understand your crown jewels? We raise this issue with top executives. Because what is it that's of most concern to you if you are attacked? And unfortunately, if you don't know that, then you don't know what the magnitude of the danger is you have. 
So this issue of, of trying to assess your risk metrics, I'm sorry if I keep going back to that, but I want you to understand why it's so challenging and why so much, so much important research is needed to make it move it forward. Sorry for that recall. Okay, so I just want to quickly um, uh, see if we can get in Robert Vega, MBA 2006, and his question is, as many people access their corporate networks remotely, how effective are VPNs and how vulnerable is the corporate network in this scenario? Well, this, in many ways this goes back uh, in, in an indirect sense to our conversation we had earlier about being air gap. That's more to do with factories. But the same reason why you have VPN is you are, whether you're a financial trader, whatever it is, you won't be able to access your company systems from home or wherever else you happen to be that's more convenient for you. And the same thing is true for factory workers who are trying to deal with remote equipment in the field. So uh, the idea of remote access is, is critical, and things like VPNs are part of the process uh, to try to make things better. The trouble is, of course, if someone uncovers your password, however they do that, then the fact you have a VPN hasn't solved it. Uh, I guess the, 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 the model I like to use in my head for many people is you can put a stronger lock on your office door, but if you're still putting the key under the mat, are you any more secure? So a VPN is a stronger lock. That's the good news. But depending upon how you use that VPN, you may or may not be more secure. And that's the challenge we have. We have to understand our behavior, our practices, and make sure they're helping us to be secure. Dr. Madnick, thank you so much for joining us today and for your insights and highlighting solutions on this very important topic. I also want to thank all of our uh, participants for joining us. To keep this conversation going over social media, please use the hashtag Sloney Chat. We hope you'll be able to join us for future MIT Sloan alumni online events made, in pop, made possible in part by the Sloan Annual Fund. As today's event comes to a close, please take a moment to complete the brief survey that will automatically pop up on your screen. And thank you again for joining MIT Sloan Alumni Online.